Super excited about this passage today as well. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, we're going we're gonna to be in a, just seven small verses, but with huge impact. And I truly love how God messes with their minds. And I, I love how he bends their eyes. And, I, and, and that's one of the reasons why I, I love watching magicians bend people's eyes. Now, when I say magicians, don't, don't freak out. I'm not talking about like black magic or sorcery or anything like that. I'm, I'm talking more about the idea of, of people just sleight of hand, taking God's creation and trying to trick us and fool us in many different types of ways. Like, for instance, watch how this guy will bend your eye, okay? Just watch some of these e- e- examples. I don't know if you've ever seen this guy. It's like, what the, you know? Like, just pay attention. Come on. Like, I mean, right? It's all got to be video edits or something. I don't understand it. It's got some nice quad muscles there. Right? I mean, come on. Look at this one. Next time you pick up your package at your house, right? Now that's a good moon pie right there. I mean, like, right? I mean, it's like bending the eye to make you think like, and they're just there to trick you and fool you and, and mess with you. But what Jesus does is it's, it's, he bends his disciples' eyes, but it's no trick, it's no gimmick. And so today we're going to be talking about one of the most popular miracles that Jesus ever uh, performed in front of his disciples, and that was when he literally walks on water. And people have been trying to explain this and try to figure out how he did it, how he could defy gravity. I mean, he literally broke the law. Talk about a lawbreaker. Literally broke the law of gravity, but that's a law that he created, so I guess he can break it, right? And, and, and it's just an unbelievable thing. And so instead of us focusing on how uh, how, you know, to how he bended the eye to figure out how he accomplished the miracle. Uh, I want us to focus more on the storm and what are we bending our eyes towards when we're in a storm. Because let's be honest, right? Every single one of us, whether we like it or not, we're all going to face storms in this life. Can I get an amen? Right? Some of you are in a storm right now. And that's why you're here today. Because you're in a storm right now and things are pretty heavy in your life. Some of you are about to walk into a storm and you don't even realize it's coming, but it's coming. And some of you have just recently walked out of a storm and you're feeling the pain still. You've got scars from that and it's still tender, if you will, because of the storm that you just walked through. So many different types of storms from relational to financial to dreams to the list goes on and on and on and on. I think specifically even now of the storm that we're seeing overseas. Um, as you turn on the news and see what's happening in Israel and, you know, you just, you know, being there, you just can't even imagine uh, what's going on and the fear that's just all over people in Israel and the surrounding areas of just this, this tension that's been going on from thousands and thousands of years ago. And it's a tension that will continually go on that we're told in scripture until the very end. And so God's not surprised by it. But today we're going to see four key ways in this story to help us focus and bend our eyes on things while we're in our storm. And I think it'll be really, really helpful for us. And so, but before we dive in, I just want to pray, but specifically, I just want us to pause and pray all individually for what's going on with the tension overseas right now and just lift up those that are impacted by that. And so just take a few moments to yourself and let's lift up uh, those that are dealing with this hostile tension over in Israel. Father, you are king, you are above all, and uh, God, I just ask that you would overwhelm your presence in that part of the world right now, and God, that you would de-escalate the situation, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come, that you would show off your power in ways that are just mind-blowing. This is something, as we know, has been going on for thousands of years. And at the root of it, it's pride, it's, um, but also it's the tension of faith and belief system. 
And so, God, I ask that you would show off your power of who you are, the one true God, like you've done many, many, many times before in that area of the world. And so may this draw people to you instead of push people away from you in this storm. We lift up the families and people that are being held captive. We think of just the children that are affected and the women that are affected. And, oh, God, uh, would you bring your protection over those? And so, God, uh, please show off your power. We pray this in the power of your son's name. Amen. Amen. So, hey, um, please grab your Bible, grab your journal as we uh, kick off into uh, continuing in John chapter 6. Again, seven short verses we'll be looking at, but it's packed with a lot of stuff. We'll be starting in verse 15. Now, this story of Jesus walking on water, we see both in Matthew's account and in Mark's account showing us that uh, the word of God never contradicts itself, but it always complements itself, giving different perspectives and details of real stories of real events that actually took place. And so we're going to be starting in verse 15. You guys ready? All right, here we go. Verse 15, it says this. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force, this means Jesus, they're going to take Jesus by force to make him king, It says that Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, we're coming off of what we learned last week. If you missed it, Jordan did an amazing job talking about the feeding of the 5,000. And they're coming just off of this amazing miracle where Jesus took a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish and multiplied it and fed all these people right in front of their eyes. And everyone's minds were blown, couldn't believe that this took place. And they were thinking, well, this person, this Jesus must be a prophet. He must be special. So let's make him our king. We want to take credit for Jesus. And so what does Jesus do? It says that he withdraws. He goes up into the mountains by himself, which got me thinking. If people all of a sudden came to you with force to make you king or to make you queen or to make you the CEO or to make you the president or to make you the leader of your work or to make you the team lead, what would you do? Would you withdraw from that honor? Would you withdraw from that fame? Would you withdraw from that power? Or would you be like, well, don't mind if I do. I'll be your king. I'll be your president, I'll be your leader, I'll be your CEO. Which reminded me that of this first point, that when we are facing storms as you're taking notes, the first thing that we need to bend our eyes towards is we need to look for the pride in the storm. Huh? What do you mean by that? Jesus withdrawing to the mountains, not taking the reins of being the king and humbling himself and not being tempted by that fame or power within his humanness, reminds us that in the midst of a storm, the storm hadn't come yet for Jesus, but the storm was coming for Jesus. It reminds us that in the midst of our storms that we need to look for the pride in ourselves. If you didn't know, I'm a very prideful person. And if you didn't know... You are a very prideful person. In fact, repeat after me. I'm a prideful person. Say it again. I'm a prideful person. It stings, doesn't it? But the truth hurts. And the reason why I know that you're a prideful person and that I'm a prideful person is because the root of all of our sin, of all the things that we do, comes from the root of pride. The root of pride is the root of... Uh, the, or the, the pride is the root of every sin that we face. And so God, in his care and love for us, shows us in every storm that we face, he brings attention to the fact that we need to be humbled. And as we're continually humbled as humans, what does it do? It helps set us apart to become more and more like Jesus. Some of you right now, you're in a financial storm. You don't know how you're going to pay the next bills. And your credit card debt just keeps going up and up and up, and you keep paying the stupid interest, and you want to scream. Some of you are in a physical storm where you have been diagnosed with some type of disease or someone you love is diagnosed with some type of disease. And it's heavy. And it's hard. And a lot of times... In the midst of a financial storm or a physical storm that you might be facing, whatever it might be, a lot of times we can kind of come off like this and say, 
I got it. I can handle this. I don't need your help. I don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to be a burden to anyone. And when we say that, I know it sounds humble, but when we say, I don't need help, or I've got this, or I don't want to bother anyone with this, that's actually at the core, at the depth of the core of our heart, is us saying, it's basically masking our pride with a humble statement. Because at the core, it's, be, it's saying that I've got this, I don't need God's strength, I have my strength, and I don't need the strength of God's people to surround me. And it's this idea of us uh, realizing in those moments to be vulnerable enough to say, I'm weak and I need God's strength. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. You can write that down just so you don't forget it. This is unbelievable because Paul not only walked through storms, but he got to the point where he gladly gloried in the storm. Listen to what it says here. It says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, would you say this with me? One more time. I'm content. But what are you content with? Listen to what he says. I'm content with weaknesses. I'm content with insults. I'm content with hardships. I'm content with persecutions. I'm content with calamities for when I am weak, then I am strong. I mean, I've been wrestling with this all week. I mean, God, Holy Spirit, God, get me to the point where I could be content with hardships and insults that come at me. To get to that point, to get to that vulnerability in our lives, to literally come to the point to say, God, you know, I am content with what is being thrown at me. This is the key to our flesh getting to the point where the spirit in us gets us to be content in our weaknesses. Weeding out the pride that we don't even realize is there and then planting seeds, new seeds of humility in our hearts. I think about the relational storms that we all face. Right? Some of you are in that right now where people are bashing your character, they're bashing your reputation, they're vexing you, they're giving you insults, it's going on and on and on, they're manipulating the words that you've said, they're trying to bury you in all this different stuff, they're disrespecting you, and you feel it. And it's tough, isn't it? And then in the midst of people throwing their stuff out at us, what do you, you, you want to respond with? You want to defend yourself? Sometimes you want to retaliate? You want to defend yourself because you want to let people know, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm not that bad of a girl. I'm not that bad of a guy. I mean, what do you want? Like, why are people coming at me like this? But then I was uh, recently, uh, I, I was reading by this old pastor. He pastored in the late 1800s. His name was Andrew Murray. And he had this line that was so good. He said, when people are vexing you, throwing insults at you and hardships at you, Instead of getting all defensive, reframe your mind and know that those insults are part of God's grace gift to humble you. And so I don't know who's bashing you or insulting you, but in the midst of those insults, what if we shifted our minds? I know it's not easy, but what if we shifted our minds to say, okay, wow, thank you, God. That is part of your grace gift to humble me. Listen, I'm a wretch. I am a worm. I am literally nothing without Christ in me who makes me something. And it's just, when those insults come, it's just a way of God's kindness to humble us and to make us more and more like him. So in the midst of your storm that you're now in, where might you need to uproot some of that old pride and let God plant some new seeds of humility? Maybe you're dealing with that physical disease right now and you need to admit that you need help as part of God's grace gift to you. Maybe people are attacking your character. Maybe you need to, instead of retaliate, absorb some of those insults as God's grace gift to you. Let's keep going. So the story continues. The event continues. It says, when evening came, 
It says his disciples went down to the sea, they got into a boat, and they started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them, and then the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Now, what happened back then at the Sea of Galilee, storms would come out of the Sea of Galilee all of a sudden, all the time. And the same thing that happened back then over 2,000 years ago is the same type of weather that actually happens today. In fact, what is that? Yes, Travis Whitaker, meteorologist, reporting with Good Morning America. Let's put the map up here. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a strong, strong uh, wind coming from the western side, just north of Capernaum, on the far west-hand side, that's rushing through here on the Sea of Galilee. And notice because of the topography right here of the mountains, because the Sea of Galilee is six to 700 feet below sea level, that is causing a nice pressure that's starting to swirl along the Sea of Galilee right now. And we're looking to see some strong storms heading today. And so that's what's happening on the Sea of Galilee. Here's what's happening at your neck of the woods. I've always wanted to do that. Always wanted to do that. Was it too much? Probably needed a... I just, you know, sorry about that. I did that <laughs> because I wanted to make a point because some of you are skeptical about the Bible and think this is maybe just not true or whatever. Listen, this is just another piece of evidence that this is not made up stories and made up lands. Literally the same weather patterns that is talked about here is the same weather patterns that happen in the Sea of Galilee all the time where storms will just come up out of just out of the blue, out of nowhere, okay? Now, the other thing is that I want us to remember, it says that they got into the boat, okay? So when you're taking notes there, I want you to just circle that they got into a boat. Who got into the boat? What got into the boat? We know that the 12 disciples got into the boat, but remember where they just came from. Literally, the feeding of the 5,000, people are trying to make Jesus their king, and then Jesus says, okay, guys, get in the boat and get out of here. Now, we don't know for sure, but I truly believe, and I'm, I'm, you know, take it or leave it, that they didn't just get into the boat empty-handed. They got into the boat with 12 baskets of bread, Okay? Because remember, there was leftovers Jordan talked about. There was 12 baskets, and maybe each of the basket was given to one of each of the disciples. This is like their souvenir. And if I was one of the disciples, I was holding on to that basket. And this is good stuff. This is like the baker of all bakers who made bread from heaven. I want this stuff, right? So they've got, in my mind, they've got the bread in the boat. But now the boat is getting rocky. And the waves are getting big and the wind's coming. They can't use their sails because it's coming from the western side. The wind's blowing and they're trying to get to Capernaum. And I just, it made me think that the bread baskets that they had were starting to roll around at the bottom of the boat. And I'm sure that they were opening up. They didn't have the containers that we have today. They couldn't like, like lock them. They didn't have those latches. And so the bread is just opening up. I imagine the bread is just spilling all over their feet. And I bring that up, and again, this is just, I'm not sure if this happened, but I guess I just makes me wonder, in the midst of their storm that they weren't expecting, did they notice the bread? Did they notice the provision that God had literally just did with them, or did they ignore that provision? When the breadcrumbs were literally hitting their feet, did they pause and remember, okay, God's got this. He, we literally just witnessed him do this, and so he's going to help us through this. So many times we can be so forgetful and forget about the miracles that are right in front of our face that he literally just did for us. I am chief knucklehead on that. God gave me this line years ago. I think I've shared it before. Uh, as we look for the provision in the storm... That's the second line, so sorry, I, I, I rushed that. If you're taking notes, when we're in the storm, we need to bend our eyes and look for the provision in the storm, the daily provision, the miracles that God has already provided for us right in front of our face. And then we need to make sure of this, that forgetfulness can be the greatest threat to faithfulness. Because we can be so forgetful that we forget what he's already done. Which made me uh, go back... Um, into my journals last night. And I was trying to remember. That's why we talk about the importance of writing things down so you can remember how God has shown off in your life. And um, so I wanted to share with you 
a journal entry I found from November 13th, 2014, okay? 2014, November 13th. Um, this was a season in Jen and I's life where we felt God was calling us to plant a church, but at that time we were scared, and then there was this other church called 242. Dave Dummett was the lead pastor, and he hired me to kind of explore what that would look like, and if should I plant one of the churches that he was going to do, or should I go off on my own and plant Mile City? You know, I didn't even know Mile City was a thing yet, right, in my brain. And so I was just in turmoil over this. And so it says here, it, was, it says decision time. It says, last week, I walked into Dave Dummett's office. He's no longer the lead pastor there. He's, he's, he's pastoring in Chicago. Um, last week, I walked into Dave's office, Thursday, November 13, 2014. The Sunday before I walked into his office, I taught at their Ann Arbor location. And I actually taught on this passage, which was fun. And here was the line that you gave me. The more we focus on the Father, the less we focus on the fear. And so I let go of my fear of trying to trust another team, and I told Dave that I'd be all in, and Jen and I would help plant their 242 next campus. Then to my surprise, as I walked into Dave's office, he said, you know, Travis, you could do that, and I'd be happy for you to do that, but what if I gave you an option, another option? What if I gave you the option and blessing to go out and start your own church, and I gave you a $100,000 check to help you start it? I was speechless. I was so ready to help and go all in there, but then all of a sudden this happened. And do I take this offer from this pastor that I respect? It seems like this is a clear sign. But then even in the midst of that moment, listen, that says, but then all my fears started to kick in. All my insecurities, all my doubts, not good enough, not smart enough, not holy enough, not educated enough, not seasoned enough, all that started to kick in. So I was reminded, God, you told me to just keep focusing on you, my father. The fear of starting a church on my own in my hometown and all that that comes with with starting a church in my hometown. Uh, I need a team. Where in the world am I going to find a team, a team with chemistry? Where am I going to find a team that we can actually afford? Where are we going to get A, B, C? I keep listing all these things. And then the last thing I wrote, which was kind of fun, I said, and Father, I need an older man on this team to help me. And so Barry Martin... On November 13th, 2014, there you are, my friend, there you are. So excited to say that. Okay, anyways, um, but man, the miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles that I've seen God show off his power within our church family is just unbelievable. I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, and I have so many different things written down in different journals of how God has done that, and so... Where might you be waiting for a miracle to happen in the midst of your storm? And where might you be forgetting that you need to be reminded of the miracles that he's already done in your life? Go back into the log of your memory and don't forget and write them down and let them encourage you. Maybe you're struggling right now with a storm where a dream that you had has been sucked right out of you. Just like just sucked away. Maybe right now you need to remember that the breath and the air that you're sucking into your lungs right now is not by accident, and he's not done with you, and he's got another plan for you. Let that lift your spirits today. Maybe you're struggling today with that physical disease. Turn your eyes towards the miracle of how he cured the worst disease that you've ever faced in your life, and that is your sin disease. And he nailed that sin disease on the cross when he was there on the cross hanging. Let that lift your spirits of the miracle and the victory that he has had over your life there. Where might you need to focus on the daily bread, his provision in the midst of your storm today? It continues. Then it says, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. And wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I mean, it's unbelievable. Jesus is literally defying gravity, walking on top of the water. Now, I highlighted three or four miles there because um, this is important, because three or four miles shows that they had been, uh, in, in, in Matthew's account, it says that it was in the third watch of the night, which would have been between 3 to 6 a.m. So this shows that they had been rowing because they, they couldn't do the sail because they were trying to head west. They were literally rowing for around eight hours this time, and they were only around three to four miles into the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And so they weren't getting far. 
They were literally, you know, just in the boat, straining, you know, the oars. And so not only were they frightened at this moment, but they were probably exhausted and frustrated in this moment right now. Because literally, they're not seeing the progress that they wanted to in the midst of the storm, and they're feeling set back. Which got me thinking, this is how some of you are right now. You are just tirelessly rowing and you feel completely set back. You keep investing in that business, you keep investing in that dream and you feel the setback. You keep investing in that marriage and you're trying to do these things and you're trying to help your marriage be better and it's just another setback. You keep investing in that child and investing in your kid and it's just like another setback, another setback in that friendship, another setback in that dream and you just literally just want to scream because you're like, when is it going to end? When is it going to stop? It reminds me of a couple things. If that's you today. The first thing it reminds me of is that one of Jesus' disciples named Peter had the courage. He was the one who stepped out of the boat and he said, can I come walk with you on the water? And Jesus said, yes. And then he came and literally walked on water with Jesus. Mind-blowing. But later, years later, after he walked on water with Jesus, listen to what he says. He says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. And so be reminded today that the storm that you're facing does not last forever. I know we want it to end now. I know we're sick of waiting. I know you're sick of waiting. But it does not last forever. And these trials that we face do something very specifically for us that it tests the genuineness of our faith. Now, I want to point out something else here. In Mark's account, it says that Jesus compelled his disciples to get into the boat. In other words, he insisted his disciples to get into the boat. What does that mean? That means that Jesus knew that the storm was coming. And so the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee was not about them just crossing the Sea of Galilee. Are you with me? They were crossing the Sea of Galilee because he was going to teach them something in the storm that he already knew that was coming for them. And so in the same way, my friends, God is not surprised by the storm that you're in. He knew you were going to walk into that storm. And for some of you, that's why you're mad at God right now. And that's a whole other message for why does God allow the storms to happen in our lives. But just real quick. We live in a fallen world. And we're all living in the effects of a fallen world. And so we have a choice. We can either push away from God in the storm or we can push towards God in the storm. Listen, God will never waste a storm. But you can't. You can waste this storm that you're in right now. Or you can look for the purpose in the storm. And that's the next one. In the midst of the storm, we need to bend our eyes and look for the purpose in the storm. God always has a purpose. Sometimes we see the full purpose on this side of heaven, but sometimes we don't. But there's always a purpose. And part of that purpose is to test the genuineness of our faith. Um, if you're taking notes, would you write down 1 John 4.20? Let me read it to you. It's not on the screen. 1 John 4.20, it says this. This is, this is in relation to relational storms that some of you are facing. This sobered me this week, okay? If anyone says... I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. What is that saying? That 
the way that you love other people that you actually see shows the genuineness of how much you love a God that you cannot see. So what does that mean? Yes, the people that are after you are bashing you or insulting you or that thing that just whenever you think of that person, you just want to give them a piece of your mind. What is that? You can either allow this situation to keep you further away from God, or you can use this situation to say, how am I responding to this individual right now? Because the way that I'm responding to this individual is actually showing how much I love my God. That'll put things into perspective, as I know it's put things into perspective for me. Look for the purpose in the storm. There's always a purpose. Don't miss it. Don't waste it. Then Jesus says this in John 6, 20. He says, it is I. Do not be afraid. In other words, he says, I'm here. Don't be afraid. I'm here. I'm with you. God's presence is all that they needed. And maybe that's all you needed to hear today. God's presence is all that you need. And so in the midst of the storm, we need to be looking for God's presence in the storm. I know it's scary. Fear can mess with us, can it? I mean, we all get scared and fearful about different things in life. In the way, you know, just, but isn't it interesting, the most common, the most common command in scripture is fear not. Do you know that? And then you know what it's always coupled with? Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so if you are in the midst of a storm, may you never forget that God is with you. He is with you. He is watching you. He's looking over you. I mean, think about this. Jesus was literally in the mountains praying over his disciples in the midst of the storm. And in the same way, Jesus is in heaven looking over you, praying over you in the midst of your storm. And guess what? They didn't have what you have, Jesus follower. Because now you have the power of the Holy Spirit who is literally with you, literally inside you as you walk through the storm. And so may we lean into the presence of God in the midst of our storm. Last verse. Then it says this. It says, Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Did you see this? You notice how I put immediately? Sometimes we miss this. You see this other crazy miracle? They were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and then it says, Immediately they were at the shore. Did he like put some type of jetpack engine on their like primitive boat? Was this some type of, you know, teleporting? Was this like high speed travel? What was this? We don't know, but it happened. Another miracle. I mean, think of the disciples' day, the last 24 hours. Feeding of the 5,000, mind blowing. Jesus walking on water, mind blowing. And now all of a sudden, high speed travel, mind blowing. I mean, what a day for these guys, right? Immediately. Now, the other thing that this reminded me of is that one day, all of us, after we sweat and go through the pain of this life, the joys, the ups and downs, and we're sweating, and the calluses and the scars that all of us will have as we walk through this earth, one day we're going to die. For those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and immediately we'll be on the shores of heaven with Jesus. You can clap for that, that's right. Immediately. Just couldn't help but think about that. Just like that. Be with Jesus. Man. What a day. But going off of the symbolism of this passage, what did they do? It says that they were glad to take him into the boat. And in the same way, for us to immediately be on the shores of heaven with Jesus when we die, we have to be people that would gladly symbolically invite Jesus into the boat of our lives and make him the captain of our lives. You know, what's interesting about Jesus is that he doesn't often force himself on us. He has, and he can, and he will, 
But oftentimes he's a God that says, here am I. Here am I, Cindy. I'm standing at the door knocking. Here am I, Steve. I'm standing at the door knocking. We have to be willing to open up and say, okay, and invite him in. That's often how our God acts with his children, not trying to force himself down our throats. But some of you are like waiting for God to make him trust you. It's like you're like waiting for him to force you to trust in him. But he's saying, here am I. I'm willing. And when you invite me in, I'll give you hope like you've never experienced. I'll give you peace that you've never experienced. I'll give you love that you've never experienced. And I'll also save you from the ultimate thing that is sinking you. And that is our sin problem for the wages of one sin separates us from God. But I'm gonna save you from that. And I made a way through that. And that's why later he died on a cross to pay the penalty for that. And then rose again three days later, proving that he was God to save us from sin that will ultimately sink us to perishing. But he says, it doesn't have to be that way. Allow me into the boat of your life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever made Jesus the captain of your life? Have you ever allowed him to save you from yourself? I can't imagine, I don't, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know how. For those of you that haven't done that yet, how do you do it? Like, how do you literally walk through your storms without the anchor of Jesus in your life? I don't know how you do it. I can't imagine walking through the storms that I've walked through in my life without Jesus being my captain. And so I got to imagine you're tired, all on your own. Doesn't have to be that way. Jesus is willing to step in. Let him step in. If you haven't done that, I want to give you the opportunity right now. And so let's just pray. So every, just, if you don't mind, just everyone just bow their heads and close their eyes with me. And maybe that's you. You just say, Travis, I have never invited Jesus into my life to save me. I don't understand it all, but what I do know today is I'm feeling something. And I want Jesus to be the captain of my life because I'm done being the captain of my own life. I'm going to lower my pride and make Jesus my savior today. If that's you... I want you to boldly step out and I'm gonna count to three. I'm not gonna embarrass you or call you out, but if that's you, if you say, Travis, I want to put, make Jesus the captain of my life today. Today's the day, no turning back. I'm gonna count to three and I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. This is about faith, putting your faith in Jesus. I wanna make Jesus the king of my life. If that's you, I'm gonna count to three. You just raise your hand so I can pray for you. One, two, three, just lift it up. Amen in the back, amen over here. You're not alone, right here, ma'am, thank you. Who else? Amazing. Anyone else to say, I wanna make Jesus the captain of my life? Okay, you guys can go ahead and put your hands on. I see you right there, sir, amen. I see you in the back, ma'am, amen. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna lead you through a real conversation. This is between you and God, okay? Just say this in the quietness of your spirit, in the quietness of your heart, just say, Father, I invite you into my life. Just say that. Right now, I want to make you the captain of my life. Forgive me for my sin. You know what it all is. Forgive me. Then just say thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising again for me. Right now, I receive you, Jesus, to be the king of my life. As we continue to pray, if you really meant that and you made that your own, (laughs) then he is so clear that you never have to worry about perishing apart from your God. The moment you leave this earth, you will immediately be in the presence of your king. Embrace that, never forget that, hold on to that. And now as you walk through the rest of your life, now you have an anchor with you. King Jesus. Father, we love you. We need you. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I ask right now that you would help those who are in a heavy storm, that you would help our eyes to bend on the things that we've talked about today. We love you and we praise you in your son's name.
Let's give it up for those who put their faith in Jesus today for the first time. It's amazing. It's incredible.